We're so glad that you're with us today. It's always good to be in God's house, and we're so thankful to be in the Lord's house on this Lord's day as we come together to worship. We want you to be welcomed as we come together. If you're a guest today, when you leave, take just a few moments and fill out the guest information sheets at the entrances and the exits when you come. Also, that's where you would place your offering, and we're so glad you're there. Also, at that same spot, you will find a list of our Sunday school classes. Please pick up that list and remember to pray for them as we come together. We need to remember to pray for Sharon Ogle. She continues to need our prayers and still very ill. Ernestine Spears still needs our prayers. She is in rehab, but she is still very, very sick, and her family hopes to take her home soon. And so please remember to pray for Ernestine Spears and lift them up in our prayers as well. Ray Moore has gone home. Give the Lord a hand and say thank you to him for that. That is good news. We also want to continue to pray for Brother Lee Jones. He's been under the weather, and so we want to lift him up in our prayers. And also Bobby uh, Fitzhugh is with us today, and we're thankful for that. If you are, say amen. That's good news. That she Give the Lord a hand. Go ahead. And that's good news. And then also we want to pray for Paula uh, Gafford and pray that God continue to work in her life. And then Ann Romine's family, that family's just been hit hard. Brother Jim has been sick this week. He needs our prayers. Teresa needs our prayers. And Ann's mother, who is 101 years old, she's been sick and has pneumonia, and she needs our prayers. And I know that our God is the great physician. If you know of somebody sick or afflicted today, would you please rise in their honor? You know of somebody sick or afflicted today, please rise in their honor. And we want to take these uh, folks to the Lord. Remember to lift them up. If you have a name and we didn't call it out and you want to call it out, take opportunity to do so. We'll start over here to my left, to, to my right. Anybody that we need to pray for over here? Okay, in the middle section, anybody's name that we need to pray for over here? Susie, let's remember to pray for Susie, cancer, and we want to remember to pray for her, Brian Davis and Kelly Taylor and Peggy with cancer as well. We want to remember to pray for these. Anybody else in this middle section? Beverly, let's continue to pray for her. Ruth Ann, John's sister Ruth Ann, let's remember to pray for her. Anybody over here that we're praying for? Nellie Jones, let's remember to pray for Nellie. I believe in prayer. If you do, say amen. And it's good to see you today, some that haven't been with us, and we're glad you're here. Let's pray together, then we're going to worship the Lord together. Let's all stand together this day, and then we're going to pray. Then Brother Clay will come and lead us as we sing by faith. And we want to live by faith and not by fear. Lord God, in Jesus' name, please accept our prayers today and supplication for these that are sick and afflicted. God, we know that you are the great physician. And Lord God, how we need you. God, you've heard all the names of the people that have been called out. And God, we pray that you'd intervene and work in their lives as only you can. God, I pray you'd bring healing. And I pray that today that you'd accept our worship of you in stillness and in truth, that you would teach us to live by faith and not by fear. In Jesus' name we pray. If you prayed that prayer with me, say amen. amen. Brother Clay, you come and lead us as we sing by faith.
I will give you thanks forever. As we think about the mountains, and we're saying just about them just a few moments ago, when you look at verse 5, for his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may last but for the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. We get to shout for joy today because we're alive in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And then notice he says that he will turn our mourning into dancing. You may think that you may not be a good dancer, but I guarantee you when we enter the portals of heaven, we will dance around the throne of God. Our mourning will be turned to dancing and we will give God a shout of joy. Say that, a shout of joy. Say it again, a shout of joy. One more time, a shout of joy. Let's pray together. Lord God, in Jesus' name, I pray that you'd accept our worship, that we would be still and know that you're the God of all creation, of all heaven and all of the earth. And God, just as sure as we are of heaven, we're that much sure of the pit, a place called hell, Sheol in this Old Testament passage of Scripture. Somebody asked me this week, in fact, a week ago today, if I believed in heaven and hell, and if I believed that people were really going to spend eternity in hell, just as they do in heaven. I do believe that, or I would not preach and teach your word. God, if it were possible for every man, woman, boy, and girl to go to heaven, we would relish in that. But God, we know that it's only possible in Jesus Christ that you teach us that there's one way to heaven, and Jesus Christ is his name. And not every man, woman, boy, and girl has called upon the name of Jesus and God, just as sure as we are of heaven and hell, we're that much sure of Jesus and that the devil is working to deceive us and to distract us. And God, I pray that you would turn our morning into dancing as we enter the portals of heaven. But in the meantime, that you would let us as your children shout for joy because we're going to live by faith and not by sight. Please be with us as a church even this week. As we host our business leaders luncheon on Tuesday at noon, God, I pray that you'd help us to be light in a dark world. Be with our mayor as he leads our city, our governor as he leads our state, our president as he leads our country. And God, I pray that you'd help us to get closer and closer to you by getting in your word and spending time praying and then by living for you. God, disciple us, grow us, help us to be the church that you've called us to be. We love you. Please accept our worship of you. In Jesus' name we pray. You may be seated. As you're seated, Brother Clay is going to continue to lead us in worship.
with me today. The God of angels' armies is always by my side. Say that with me. The God of angels' armies is always by my side. Today, as we worship through our tithes and offerings, we teach our folks that when they're away from their home church, their tithe and offering belongs there. Today, God just continues to bless Lifeline in our giving, not only our giving, but as we give to the cooperative program, as we support the work of our six seminaries, the International Mission Board, North American Mission Board, and the Arkansas Baptist Children's Home, we're reminded of how good God is. And not only that, God has allowed you to give six of these um, scholarships to the University of Arkansas here in Little Rock, and that's been a blessing this week. Give the Lord a hand and thank him for all that he is doing. Also, we take this time to listen to God. If our ushers were coming forward, they would not even come in until we had time to listen to God. So as you listen to the music today, listen to God. Ask God to speak to you. Our theme this month is Sunday School, and it is focusing on Acts chapter 20, verse 20. How the Apostle Paul says, I did not shrink back from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house. And as we think about a post-pandemic vision for Lifeline Baptist Church, we understand that that will start the moment that we realize that we can move forward from this pandemic. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for it to be over. If you are, go ahead and hold up your hand. Go ahead and give the Lord a hand and say, Lord God, help us. But we need a post-pandemic vision. And we want to grow the church on Sunday school prayer and discipleship focused on Jesus Christ and Christ alone. And we need to be ready at all times to share the gospel. Let's pray. We're going to listen to our offertory. As we listen to our offertory, when we finish, Miss Leighton is going to come and sing for us today. We're going to worship the Lord together. Join me, please, as we pray. Lord God, in Jesus' name, I pray that you'd be glorified in all that we say and do. I pray that you'd take our tithes and offerings and use them for your glory and your glory only. I thank you for every lifeliner who fills this place today. I pray for those that are viewing via live stream or on Facebook or on YouTube. And I pray, Lord God, that you would intervene and change our lives. God, help us to understand why we call Sunday school Sunday school. Help us to grow upon the word of God and to grow in our prayer time and then to be discipled as never before and to make disciples. And God, take every penny that we collect as Christians and use that for the furtherance of your kingdom. May you be glorified in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. God's people said.
so much you should have heard it the way that I heard it there is peace on earth there is peace in Christ say that with me there is peace on earth there is peace in Christ make sure today that you have your Bibles open with me today as we study God's Word in 1st Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 through 5 1st Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 through 5 as we think about this passage of Scripture today, we're going to be looking, excuse me, not verses 1 through 5, but verses 6 through 10. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 10. And so please make sure that you have your Bible, Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 10. And as we study God's Word together, we're reminded of our purpose. And this month we're focusing on Sunday school. September 6th with Decade Sunday, and today as we think about September 13th, Adult Sunday School. If you were in one of our Adult Sunday School classes today, we want you to know how important that you are to us because you lay a foundation for what God is doing in our church. Next Sunday will be Youth Sunday. The last Sunday of this month will be Children's Sunday in Sunday School. Sunday School is Bible study that gets people through the Bible so that they can make it through the week. 
Sunday school is Bible study that gets people through the Bible so that they can make it through the week. We call it Sunday school because we do it on Sunday. That's when most of us can get together and we do it on Sunday mornings because we want to make sure that during the week we prioritize who we are. My number one priority is God. My number two priority are Pam and my children, my family. And my number three priority is Lifeline Baptist Church because God has called me here. And every day, early in the morning, I try to remind myself of my, remind myself of my priority. We need to know our priority. And as a church, one of our key priorities is Sunday school to take people through the Word of God. To me, Sunday school is the most important hour at Lifeline Baptist Church. As we think about Sunday school, then we are reminded of 2 Timothy 2.15. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Now we think about the strategy of Sunday school. If we're going to lay a vision, if we're going to cast a vision and a strategy, we know our purpose and our Church purpose statement comes to us from Matthew 22, 36 through 40. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself, the abbreviated church purpose statement. Our vision is to do that through Sunday school prayer and discipleship. Say those three things with me, please. Sunday school prayer and discipleship. Say them again. Sunday school prayer and discipleship. Notice birth through fifth grade, we need to teach them the word of God. 6th grade through 12th grade, we need to teach them to apply the Word of God. And then number three, young adults, uh, need, we need to teach them to live the Word of God. And then we think about the Word of God and how we teach and how we think that we uh, have the Word of God. Most of us today work on what is referred to as a verbal plenary, uh, plenary inspirational view. Verbal plenary inspirational view. And here it is twofold. How do we come up? with the Word of God. How do we have it in 66 books in the Bible? Number one, it's God-inspired. This is a word in the Greek New Testament in the New American Standard that means God breathed. The individuals that wrote the Bible, God breathed the words. And so if you're in the Old Testament, you take the Hebrew words that were used there. I believe that God chose those words and He instructed the men and the women in the Old Testament to use and to write those words in what we have in the Old Testament books of the Bible. Number two, God breathed in the New Testament. I believe that God chose those Greek New Testament words and he gave them to the men and women that God used to write the New Testament. As we think about that, we understand that not only is it God inspired, God breathed, but God inspires individuals and he inspired those individuals. They wrote the books and the words in the Bible. Those individuals like me and you are sinners. There's only one sinless person. Say his name with me. Jesus. There's only one sinless person, and his name is Jesus. And we're reminded of that. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All scripture is inspired by God. That word inspired means God breathed in the Greek New Testament word. All scripture is inspired or God breathed by God and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So this morning as we even get into our message, I want you to understand all scripture is God breathed. Say that with me please. All scripture is God breathed. Say it again. All scripture is God breathed. One more time. All scripture is God breathed. If you want to get technical, that's called a verbal plenary inspirational view of how we arrive with God's word, or derive God's word. Now, the biblical cycles of teaching are threefold, excuse me, fivefold. Number one, God teaches Paul, Paul teaches Timothy, Tim Timothy teaches the church, the church teaches the people, and the people teach adults. Now, follow this with me today. Notice that. Uh, God teaches Paul. Paul saved on the Damascus Road, one born out of due time. He was a Pharisee. He was on his way to get permission to persecute more Christians, even to the point of death. He had been involved in the death of Stephen, and God saved him. And so God teaches Paul, and then Paul teaches Timothy. 
and then Timothy teaches the church. Now, why do we say that Paul teaches Timothy? Because 1 Timothy is one of the Pauline epistles where Paul directly addresses Timothy, probably his son in the faith, one that he has led to the Lord himself. He has discipled him. He was in initiating the call of salvation. He initiated uh, Timothy's call to ministry, and he had met with his mother and his grandmother, Lois and Eunice, and so God teaches Paul, Paul teaches Timothy, Timothy teaches the church, and the church teaches the people, and the people, we're responsible for teaching adults, for teaching adults. We have over 20 uh, Bible classes, Sunday school classes at Lifeline Baptist Church. We met this morning as well as we can with social distancing. If you're an adult and you're an adult Sunday school class, would you please rise? You're an adult, and you're in an adult Sunday school class. Would you please rise? We want to recognize you today as Adult Sunday School Day. Give these adults a hand and thank them for allowing God to use them. Now, as we think about adults, if you're in a Sunday school class at all, whether you're an adult or you're a student, would you please rise? All Sunday school people, would you please rise? Ultimately, if, and if you're not in the class and you're in the sanctuary, would you please rise so that we can uh, uh, honor you? I believe that Sunday school is the most important hour at Lifeline, and we need to be mindful of that. Now, let's read together 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 10. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 10. In pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus constantly nourished on the words of faith and of sound doctrine which you have been following. Nothing to do with worldly fables, fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourselves for the purpose of godliness, for bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance, for it is for this we labor and strive because we have fixed our hope on the living God, the Savior of all men, especially of believers. Bow and pray together today. Lord God, in Jesus' name, I pray that you'd accept the reading of your word. You, we know that you preserved it for us. As I look out over this congregation, God, I'm mindful of those that hold the word of God as, as accurate without error, and they're willing to teach it and to stand in honor of it. God, I pray that you would help us to build our church on Sunday school on prayer and discipline. And God, I pray you'd speak to me and through me in these next few moments. For we pray in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Now, as we get started this morning with Sunday School, we're going to go back also and take a look at verses 1 through 5 in 1 Timothy chapter 4, just so that we're on the same page. Remember Sunday School. Number one, Sunday School is built on the Word of God, 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, and Sunday School is built on discipline, 1 Timothy 4, 6 through 10. Now, as we think about that, then we're going to look at Sunday School being built upon the Word of God. Last Sunday, we talked about apostasy, the falling away from faith, in 1 Timothy 4, 1 through uh, 3. This morning, we're going to pick up with the sanctifying of the saved, 1 Timothy 4, 1, and then verses 3 through 5. So look back with me, please, at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. But the Spirit, notice that that word Spirit is capitalized. The Spirit explicitly says, and then he tells us what he says. In latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars, seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For every, everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude, for it is sanctified by the means of word of the word of God and prayer. I am sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Say that with me. I am sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Say it again. 
I am sanctified by the word of God and prayer. As we think about the falling away, we addressed that last week. We ended on when we fall away, when we've entered into apostasy. I define the word apostasy for you. When we've fallen away from the teachings of the apostles, then we've entered into apostasy and we begin to attack marriage and everything that God has created and we begin to use things for purposes that God did not intend them to be used for. And I realize that we hit marriage and we hit the green plant rather heavy last week. And all last Sunday afternoon, my phone went off, even into the week. It was all positive, and it mainly was people telling me that they're struggling with marriage difficulties or they're struggling with abusing either food or drugs or alcohol, and they want God to get them through that abusive system or that addiction in their life. And friend, let me say to you, I'm not going to repeat that, but I will say again, because I believe that it is important, when any age is as far away from the gospel as we are, the birth, the death, the uh, birth, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we're going to begin to fall away. And as soon as we begin to fall away, we attack marriage and then we go after all the things that can be misused. And instead of using the things that God created for God's good, then we begin to misuse them and to use them for our good. And we begin to leave God out of everything. Ultimately, that is what apostasy is. And when apostasy really began to take hold and to shape your generation and mine is in the 1940s in other places that had once said that God's word was without error that once said that God's word was true, that once said that God's word was in God breathed, and then they came back and they said, no, 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 I don't think God's word is God breathed anymore. And the first thing that they begin to attack are the miracles of Jesus Christ, the turning of the water into wine, the healing of the lame and making the blind to see and the deaf to hear, and then ultimately the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Ultimately, when you deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have no hope and we have no faith. I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you do, give God a hand and thank him for raising Jesus Christ from the dead. If there is no resurrection, then you and I are to be pitied above all men, as the Apostle Paul says. Now, as we think about the falling away, we begin to move to the sanctifying of the saved. What does it mean to be sanctified? Number one, it means to be clean. It means to be holy. It means to be set aside. And notice what he says about the sanctifying of the saints or the saved in 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 3, 5. Number one, the first process of sanctifying is that the Spirit of God speaks and I hear. Say it with me. The Spirit of God speaks and I hear. Say it again. The Spirit of God speaks and I hear. I do not want you to hear me today. I want you to hear God. I do not want to hear you. I want to hear God. And then number two, God, Theos, created all the food to be grateful for, for us to be grateful for and to share by believers and tr uh, by believers and those that are true knowers. They know the truth in 1 Timothy 4, 3. Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. I not only believe, but I know the truth, not because I'm special, but because I dive into the word of God. And so we think about sharing, and I'm reminded of St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, and I'm reminded of the king's parable, and the parable, excuse me, Jesus' parable of the king. And when the king begins to say, when you've done it unto the least of these, my brothers, you've done it unto me. When I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was an alien or a stranger or undocumented, you took me in. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick, you came unto me. And when I was in prison, you came and visited me. You came unto me. You helped me walk through even the chains of my prison. And friend, I want you to understand today that that's what God's doing at Lifeline Baptist Church, particularly as we think about Mission Little Rock, 
as we advocate what God is doing, as we minister to the people around us, beginning in Southwest Little Rock, going through our city, our state, our country, and ultimately until we reach the ends of the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so ultimately we know the truth and we understand that we are believers of the truth. And then we move into number three. Everything created by God is good and not to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. 1 Timothy 4.4. 4. Now, a lot of people misuse this scripture today and say, well, everything that's created is created by God, and if I receive it with thankfulness, then I get to use it. Nope. Paul comes back and he addresses this in 1 Corinthians 10.23. He says, all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. And so let me say to you, if it's been created, God did it. If you get that, hold up your hand. And God means for everything that's been created for his glory and for his glory only. The problem with that is we begin to think that God's made everything for our glory. God created every green plant for me. God created every this, every that for me. And we have problems with our eyes, our ears, our mouth, our mind, and our hands and our feet. And we've not discipled men and women. And they do not understand confessional discipleship. They've never been accountable to God. And they are not accountable to each other. But friend, let me say to you, God painted that picture of accountability in marriage between God and the man and the woman in marriage and then between God, the man and the woman in marriage and these people that we call parents. If you're a mama or a daddy, would you stand up real quickly? If you're a mama or a daddy, would you stand up real quickly? Friend, I want to speak to you. I don't care how young or how old you are. If you're a mama or a daddy, God has called you to teach your children the word of God and God has called you to have your children in Sunday school as long as they're under your roof and God has called you to pray with your children to teach them how to pray and God has called you to be the chief discipler of your children and there is no excuse for bad parenting in the United States of America we need revival and it's going to come when you and mamas and daddies get right with God then we'll have revival in your house and then we'll have revival in this house I'm proud of you as mamas and daddies I want to exhort you and I want to say keep going give our mamas and daddies a hand and thank them Friend, it is not the time for you to be your student's friend. Be your student's parent. You may be seated. They need a parent, and we need to understand that everything has been created for our good. Number four, the Word of God sanctifies in 1 Timothy 4, 5. If the Word of God doesn't say it's okay, then it's not okay. If the Word of God doesn't say it's okay, then it's not okay. We do a lot of what we call Bible study, and again, we never condemn. Remember that in John chapter 8, we've been through that. The Pharisees brought the woman who had been caught into adultery into the courts of the temple, and they accused her. That's what we tend to do. We're accusers, just like Satan. And they accused her, and Jesus, and by the Jewish custom, she should have been stoned. And Jesus said, ye without sin cast the first stone. He was the only one in the room that could have cast it. And everybody got up and they left in his presence because they were humbled by God. I want to be humbled by God in my own body, in my own flesh, so that God doesn't have to humble me through my wife or my children. And friend, let me say to you today, we see all kinds of things happening into, in our world. None of us in this room are above sin, not even our pastors. And I'm thankful for those that serve on our pastoral and support staff, but none of us are above sin. And friend, let me remind you, pride comes before the fall. And we need to be humble in these days, and we need to serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and we need to be sanctified by the word. And if the word doesn't say that I can do it, then I do not need to be doing it. Then we need to be sanctified by prayer in 1 Timothy 4, 5. As we be, think about being sanctified by prayer, how does that work? That means in Matthew 18, 19, when the Bible says, If two ask in the name of Jesus, it shall be done. I believe that if you do hold up your hand. 
And then it says in 1819 that if two or three, in 1820, if two or three gather together, there he is in the midst. Friend, I do not have to invite Jesus in this room. He was in this room before I came, and he'll be in this room when I leave, and he'll get in that vehicle with me, and he will go home with me because my God is everywhere all the time. He sees all things, hears all things, he knows all things. He knows what you're thinking right this very moment. And in spite of that, he loves you. Isn't that good news? And so we need to sanctify ourselves with the word and prayer. We need to be a praying church. That's why we call out the prayer request at the beginning of our services because we do not gather as often as we used to get together. I saw somebody walk in today that sent me the picture of them last Sunday where they had fallen, looked like they'd been beat up. Friend, aren't you glad today? The Spirit brings revival and the Spirit can bring us into God's house. We need prayer. We need to be sanctified by prayer and we need to be sanctified by the Word. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of the soul and the spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Matthew 18, 19, as I've already said, two or three are gathered, there he is in the midst. And so we begin to think about Sunday school built upon the word of God, our application, study, teach, reach, and pray. Say that with me. Study, teach, reach, and pray. Say it again. Study, teach, reach, and pray. Sunday school is built upon discipline as we think about these scriptures from 1 Timothy 4, 6 through 10. And as we think about them, they're threefold today. Number one, the disciplinarians. We've already addressed them as our parents, 4, 6. Number two, the disciplines of the word of God, 1 Timothy 4, 7 through 10. And number three, the disciplinarian of the disciplinarians. Who is Jesus? 1 Timothy 4.10. Now this morning, our time will allow us to talk about the disciplinarians, 1 Timothy 4.6. If you're an adult, you are a disciplinarian. And friend, let me say, as humbly as I know how, and let me remind you when I preach, I'm preaching to the preacher, and I pray to God that I'm preaching, and that, that preaching is sanctified by word and by prayer, his word, not mine. And let me say to you, that you and I are disciplinarians and the buck stops with us and we can't blame anybody else. If the church is dying, it's our fault. If the church is alive and well, it's our fault because the church belongs to Jesus. Now, as we think about the disciplinarians, let me remind you in fivefold way, verse six, verse six, look at verse six with me and pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and on sound doctrine, which you have been following. And so notice in verse 6, the disciplinarians, five things listed in this passage of Scripture. Number one, brothers that point out the things of God. Now, you've been with somebody and you've had something on your, you've been eating and you had something on your face and they didn't point it out and you got up and you went to the mirror and you looked and there was something gross between your teeth or you had food all over you had, and you thought, why didn't they point that out? And then you meet people, it doesn't matter what's on you or how long it's been there, even if it's a little bitty thing, they're going to pick at it until they get it off of you. I don't know which one I like better, but we think about if we are true brothers, we're going to point things out. But what are we going to point out? Notice this. We point out the things of God. Stop pointing out to people the things that do not belong to God, the things that are not going to be eternal. As my sister says, the things that are not going to be here in a hundred years. The only thing that is eternal are our eternal souls. And we need to point out the things of God to each other in a loving, kind way not in a condemning way. Number two, notice that we need to point out the things of God in verse six, as well as verse five from the last passage of scripture. Number two, we need to understand that we are God's servants. We're the servants of Jesus Christ. I am a doulos. I am a slave to God. Say that with me. I am a slave to God. I'm here to serve you, not to be served. You're here to serve God. We love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and our neighbor is ourselves. God, neighbor, self, we are here to serve. 
We have mistakenly think that when we come to church, we're here to be entertained and that the worship is about us and that the preaching is about us and that the church is about us and that what we do with the programs and outreach and fellowship, it's all about us. Everything should be about Jesus Christ and Christ alone. We're here to serve. And then number three, God's servants are nourished on the words of God. Not my words, not your words, but the words of God. And then number four, God's servants are constantly nourished on sound doctrine. If I got up here and preached sound doctrine, or if I preached doctrine that was not sound, I wonder how many people that are listening, that are here, would know the difference. Sometimes we're duped and deceived because we did not get into the doctrine ourselves. One of the things that I relish most about being the pastor of Lifeline Baptist Church is because you are disciplinarians who've been in the word of God and prayer. And when I say something wrong, you love me enough to question it. And you love me enough to walk through it. Notice number five. They are followers of the words of faith and sound doctrine. We do not fo follow old wives' tales, as it's referred to in this text. Now, friend, let me say to you the difference between a wives' tale... And you can notice that Paul's writing Timothy, Eunice, and Lois probably didn't like this phrase, wise tale, because I want to say to you, as many women come up with tales, as many men come up with tales. Go ahead and say amen, women. I'll never forget. One time as a young man, we'd gone camping, which was our normal thing on vacation. And I was down swimming in the creek, clear water creek, and we were having the time of our life, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, I heard somebody yelling and screaming, and it sounded like my mother, and it got my undivided attention. And so I went back under the water one more time, and when I came back up, I could still hear that woman yelling and screaming. And I thought at one point that I heard Jeffrey, and I thought, boy, I better go running. And so I jumped up out of that water, and I took off running on the rocks, no shoes, and I ran up, and there was my little short skinny mother with our chihuahua dolly and there was a big german shepherd and it had put all fours on my mother's chest and my mother had dolly our chihuahua and she had her chain and she was swirling dolly around the top of her head just as fast as she could and she was yelling and screaming call off your dog call off your dog and she had everybody in the camp's undivided attention, and the owner of the dog called off the dog. Friend, let me say to you, as the New Testament church, because of the word of God and prayer, we have the power to call off Satan from hell itself, because greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. And if the church would only pray and be sanctified with the word of God, we could call off Satan from our marriages, our homes, our children, our families, our schools, and our government and we would have revival in the church place if you're willing to call off Satan in the power and the blood of the resurrection of Jesus Christ would you stand up with me please this morning we need to call off Satan say that with me we need to call off Satan say it again we need to call off Satan and if Satan is attacking you then I want you to claim greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world because we can be sanctified by the word of God and by prayer, but we must be disciplined. Would you bow your heads with me, please, and close your eyes. Nobody's looking around. If you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your personal Lord and Savior, or you're not sure, would you pray a prayer like this right now? Would you say, Lord God, in Jesus' name, I want to know that I know that I'm saved. I want Satan called off of my life. I'm sick of the attack. I want to be a Romans 10, 9 Christian. I want to confess with my mouth that Jesus should be the Lord of my life, and I believe that God raised him from the dead. I want salvation, rich, red, and royal in the blood of Jesus Christ. Save me right now. Save me right now. If you prayed that prayer and you asked Jesus to save you today, nobody's looking around. You asked Jesus to save you today. Would you look at, raise your head and look into my eyes and hold up your hand so I can see who you are? You asked Jesus to save you today. Would you do that? 
Thank you. If you're a Christian, maybe you're a member of Lifeline Baptist Church and Satan's been attacking you and you're ready to call him off. As you can in the power and the blood of Jesus Christ, as you remember, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. You have resurrection power. And if Satan's been attacking you and you say, Lord God, in Jesus' name, please call Satan off of my life. I need revival today. If that's you, would you hold up your hand? Just hold it up. That's right. Just hold it up. That's right. All over the place. Nobody's looking around. That's right. Just hold it up. Amen and amen and praise God. Praise God. And I want you to pray a prayer like this. Hold up your hand. Hold up your hand. And I want you to pray, Lord God, in Jesus' name, I'm tired of the attacks of Satan. And Satan, through the power of the resurrection that's in me, I call you off and I tell you, you have no authority in my life. I rebuke you in the power and the blood in the name of Jesus Christ. God, I pray that you'd work in me. Remind me of your promises. Sanctify me by your word. Sanctify me by prayer. And if you prayed that prayer, would you hold up your hand? Hands all over the place today. Friend, now everybody look right here. If you're here today and you want to join Lifeline Baptist Church by letter, by statement, by promise of the letter, would you hold up your hand so that we know who you are? Okay. Now, Lifeliners, I want to say to you, as God leads us through these pandemic days and we get to the end of the pandemic, we're going to lay out a vision of Sunday school growth, prayer growth, and discipleship growth. Where and what does God want us to do next? And we need to be sanctified by the word and by prayer. If you get that, say amen. We need to focus on the discipline of the sound doctrine. Pray with me, please, as we close. If you made a decision today, please call us at 501-568-5433, or you can call my personal cell, 501-529-2324. Jordan Bowen's going to come up here to the microphone, and he's going to close us in prayer as he does. Remember all the activities, business leaders, lunch on Tuesday at noon. We're going to social distance. If you've not made your reservation, make it come. We're going to be spread out. We're going to have a good time. And so, Jordan, come up to this microphone here, and you're going to close us in prayer. Thank you for being here today, and thank you for all your love and support celebrating our anniversary. I walked in today and had a gift in my office. Thank you so much for all of your love. We love you. God, I thank you for being with us. I thank you for um, bringing everyone here. God, I pray that you'd be with us through this pandemic and uh, be with all the school teachers and uh, first responders. God, anyone that's uh, having to directly do, deal with this. And I uh, pray that you'd be with us the rest of the week. In Jesus' name, amen.